got a strong covering force east of the river. from all over Europe have been ordered to mobilize. Units from the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, the United States and Britain. And forming an integral part of the British Army's response to this urgent call are men of the Territorial Army. Things are not quite as they seem. The West is not under attack. And in spite of appearances, these territorials are on their way to take part in one of the biggest military exercises of recent years. An exercise in Germany, in which the NATO armies are rehearsing the complex mobilization of supplies, vehicles and men, which would have to take place within days of a real emergency. For the territorials, this is part of their training during which they will practice their military skills alongside their regular army counterparts. These men are all civilians, volunteers who give up a large part of their spare time to soldiering. There are nearly 60,000 of them, and together they make up 30% of the battle order of the British Army. They come from all walks of life and every conceivable civilian occupation. Why do they do it? And what's in it for them? John Negus works in his parents' corner shop and post office in Ipswich, nine to five every day and a half day Saturday. Yes, that's um, Two years ago, a chance meeting in a pub with one of his mates, already in the TA, persuaded him to have a go himself. He's now in the infantry, one company of the 5th Royal Anglians. Tonight is drill night, the weekly TA training session. And since John's car is temporarily off the road, a bit of friendly persuasion has been exercised and his girlfriend, Debbie, has volunteered a lift. Are you ready? Yeah. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Nagus. Hello, Debbie. Shall I forget him? Yes, Okay. Yep. All members of independent TA units are expected to put in a minimum of 12 training days a year plus a 15-day annual camp. Most, like John, do a lot more. He's 20 now, and in two years of TA service, he's risen to corporal. He's now an experienced TA soldier, and in a position to pass on some of his expertise to his mates. So, we've done some stripping with it, as I said. So, TD, come out and strip this gun. The only difference between TA soldiers and regulars is that they have less time available in which to learn the same skills, the intricacies of the same weapons, self-loading rifle and general purpose machine gun, submachine gun, and Carl Gustav anti-tank weapon. And apart from the weapons, all those other military skills, drill, fire control orders, enemy location, radio, field craft, camouflage and concealment, map reading. Up to the road junction, swinging round, marking the piece of paper, and then swinging round up to point B. Paul Goodchild has just completed his recruit carder. Two weeks of intensive training at the infantry depot. Two weeks to cram in what regular army recruits learn in 18. And just like the regular army, women play an important part in the territorials. Nurses in the volunteer reserve of the Queen Alexandra's Royal Army Nursing Corps have to know where they're going to. Right, let's start from the beginning here. 
We put on the zero here, go across. New Fawcett is a 22-year-old press setter with Blue Star Engineering close to the borders of East London. He's also a member of his local TA unit, 215 Squadron of the Royal Corps of Transport at Grey's Essex. His civilian job is a demanding one, keeping the production lines rolling for a company which turns out steel components for the telecommunications industry. No time for breakdowns. How then does the TA fit in with this kind of schedule? Neil is lucky. There's someone who can take over when he's away. But the hard fact is that the TA relies on the goodwill of civilian employers. Employers who appreciate the job that the TA does and who are willing to take a little extra trouble in juggling their own schedules to give these men the extra time they need. The regular midweek drill night at 215 Squadron Royal Corps of Transport is a little different from the infantry. Neil Fawcett is one of the Army's long-distance lorry drivers. Four-tonners, ten-tonners, and heavy-duty forklifts. The Royal Corps of Transport is the Army's lifeline, transporting the men, loading and then carrying supplies of food, equipment, fuel and ammunition from where they are to where they're needed. Right, that'll do. Come on, lads, let's go and have a drink. But it's not just all work, either. The local TA drill centre, like drill centres up and down the country, is a focal point for all kinds of social activities as well. <laughs> it's a place for a friendly get-together when the work is over. A place for wives and girlfriends to get a look in and find out how their men folk spend their time. A place for Neil and people like him to relax amongst friends, discuss plans for the future, and reminisce about the past. The 18th century equivalent of today's territorials cuts somewhat different figures. Formed from rural stock as the yeomanry, they were intended to protect our fair country from the dastardly French invader. Luckily, their warlike expertise was never put to the test. During the relatively peaceful 19th century, their duties were mostly ceremonial. So they simply paraded, drilled and practiced, just in case. Their first taste of real action was in the Boer War. But it was in the Great War, fighting for the first time as the Territorials, that they really came into their own. The Yeomanry, for example, took part in some of the last British cavalry charges of all time. The Territorials were now indistinguishable from their regular army counterparts. During the 20s, after the cruel lessons of the First War, the Yeomanry became mechanized, after a fashion. From 1939 onwards, Territorials of all units played their part in some of the most heroic actions of the Second World War. They grew up the hard way and became what they are today. During the last 30 years, military thinking has changed dramatically. Specialist units of the Territorial Army have been formed to organize vital civilian services in the event of a modern war. These are the sponsored units of the TAVR, made up of civilian specialists, trained to extend their professional skills into a military role. Greg Holmes, an operating department assistant in a large general hospital, is a member of one of these sponsored units, a field hospital. With his unit, he becomes an operating theater technician, the same job under a different name. He's only expected to give up four days a year to training. On top of this, though, is annual camp. And Greg Holmes is on his way to join the 5th Royal Anglians, 215 Transport Squadron, and the Royal Yeomanry in Germany. Germany, the Suntel feature near Hanover. Thousands of square miles of rolling forest 
And in the middle of it, the fifth Royal Anglians, digging in. Come on in. Let's have a go in here. Among them is Corporal John Negus, section commander in one platoon. Go on, boy. Let's have a shovel in here. Enough for me. <laughs> Even section commanders have to take their turn. Several miles away is the headquarters encampment of the Sherwood Rangers, a squadron of the Royal Yeomanry. A curious breakfast is being prepared, and not much like mums, but sustaining enough. Corporal Don Brown, commander of the squadron's main communication vehicle, faces the reality of a new day. He's due on watch in the radio-equipped Saracen armored car which keeps 24-hour contact with observation posts strung out along a 10-mile perimeter. First task, get briefed by an officer who has already been on watch since midnight. 736409. Uh, I'm going to send two, three to help him out. The exercise enemy are moving, and a fox armored car is sent from its farmyard hideout to find out where and how many. The command of the fox is Sergeant Hello. Glenn Turner. Hello, uh, Fox 4923, grid 736409. Over. Glenn's job and the tactical role of the Royal Yeomanry is armoured reconnaissance to probe stealthily into enemy-held territory, discover what the enemy is up to, and then get out fast without firing a shot. The enemy tanks are busy this morning. Something serious is in the wind. Suddenly, a report comes through from Don Brown at Squadron HQ. A friendly helicopter in reconnaissance has spotted an enemy light tank moving towards Glenn's position. Reverse! To avoid contact, Glenn makes discretion the better part of valor. No sense in sticking around to face superior armor and firepower. He takes advantage of his Foxy's greatest asset, speed and maneuverability. The enemy tank turns out to be a scorpion, and it goes past totally unaware of Glenn Turner. Hello, two, this is two, three. With the enemy out of the way, Glenn now has time to send a detailed report. Two, one, seven, one, eight, five. A five of the tanks and two scorpions are moving east. I'm observing, over. It was worth the risk. An enemy armoured column is moving in frighteningly fast, straight across country. And behind them, inevitably, will come the armoured personnel carriers with the infantry. As the enemy tank formations rumble on, they are bombarded by artillery in a desperate attempt to stop their advance. With ammunition running low and only a small proportion of the enemy tanks destroyed, 215 Transport Squadron is called in to bring fresh supplies direct to the gun positions. For Keith Brown, part of Neil Fawcett's unit from Grey's, this is his first exercise, his first real test under operational conditions. The equipment, together with the teamwork practiced so often at home, now comes into its own and proves its worth. As the tanks draw nearer, the Anglians prepare to defend their positions. The outlying platoons are in constant touch with their company commander. The enemy is now advanced in combat team strength to the area of approximately grid 130543. Hello, all stations one. This is one. Stand to... As it turns out, the enemy commander decides to bypass the Anglian position and strike further back. For John Negus's section, there is nothing to do but wait and keep their eyes open as the enemy rolls by. Meanwhile, a real disaster has struck the yeomanry. 
Returning from their reconnaissance, one of the foxes has run off the road. Its signaler is unconscious and could be badly hurt. Accidents happen on even the best run exercises. But luckily, professional medical help is only a radio call away. Well, as you know, this is to uh, Nodorf Abquest, uh, Kazivak grid 687-482, immediately. Over. Whilst waiting for the Abquest to materialise, the victim is given immediate first aid by a trained medic on the spot. Within minutes, an RAF Wessex arrives to take the injured man to a field ambulance station where he'll receive preliminary treatment. If the doctors at the field ambulance station think it necessary, the injured man can then be sent on to a fully equipped field hospital. Okay. As it turns out, he's had a serious hemorrhage while on the way to the field hospital, and immediate life-saving brain surgery is called for. Greg Holmes, on the staff of the field hospital as an operating theatre technician, will be involved in the operation. This is a chance for Greg to do what he does every day of his working life, but under rather different conditions. He's been joined by Jenny Fellows, theatre sister, another TA member. Morning, Carlos. Morning. Meanwhile, at the front lines, the deep thrust of the enemy tanks has caused the commanding officers to discard their old plans and replace them with new ones. The enemy, it seems, have overstretched themselves. They are far from supplies of fuel, ammunition and food, beyond the range of their own artillery and still advancing. The commander has formulated a daring plan to use his air mobile reserve to attack the enemy's lines of communication and supply, slowing down his advance and allowing precious time to regroup in stronger positions. The Anglians, and John Negus's platoon in particular, have been elected for the task. Anglians go in by chopper over the line of the enemy's advance. This is a game of tactical leapfrog. Come on, come on, come on, come on, move, move. The enemy is taken completely by surprise.
don't. Let's go on. The exercise is over. Two weeks of something that has varied from hard grinding slog to moments of towering excitement. One thing it's never been is boring. Time now to relax, eat the first proper food in what seems like an eternity, and then go home. For the Royal Anglians to go home, to Ipswich, Great Yarmouth, Grimsby and Harford. For 215 Transport Squadron to go home, to the massive sprawl of Greater London. Okay, Doc. For the Sherwood Rangers to go home to Nottingham and Northampton. Home to jobs which are as different as lawyers and dustmen, factory workers and shop assistants. But next year they'll be back. If not here, then somewhere else in the UK or overseas as part-time professional soldiers in the Territorial Army. <laughs>